All right, hear me out. I have this text file here that I want to turn into malware or a malicious executable. But the thing is, it's just a plain text file. Nothing more, nothing less. It's not some sort of a binary that has a structure that we can tweak or manipulate to execute code. However, there's a catch. You see, the operating system only recognizes that this is a text file from the TXT extension. I'm talking here about file recognition, not file processing. Those two are completely different things. But anyway, since we can execute code directly from a text file, we still can hijack the default program for text files, which is exactly like you guessed, notepad. So here's what we're going to do. Whenever a victim opens a text file, we will first take the file name that the victim wants to open. Then we will run our malicious code, and once we're done, we will run notepad and pass to it the file name, so that everything looks legit. So now, the first thing we need to do is to create our malicious code. The malicious code doesn't have to be a portable executable, by the way. You can use a PowerShell script or a batch script. Anything will do the trick. But for this video, we will create a program that takes the contents of any text file a victim opens and sends it to our attacker machine, and then opens the text file for the victim so that everything looks normal. And here's the code for that. In the main function, we first define the attacker IB address and the port. Then we convert both the full path to the text file and the attacker machine IP address to wide strings because the Windows API only works with wide strings. I explain the difference between normal strings and wide strings in detail in this video, exactly at this time. Next, we have a basic Windows socket or WinSock boilerplate. We first initialize the WinSock handler and check if it was a success. If not, we use shell execute to open notepad and pass to it the path to the text file that the victim wants to open and then we kill the process. And we have to do this each time we encounter any error because even if we can exfiltrate the contents of the file, we still need to open it for the victim so that everything looks normal. Next, we create a socket instance and check for errors. If there are any, we do the same thing we did before. Next, we define the socket structure and pass to it the address family, which is IBV4 and the server port. Then we use the initptom function to convert the attacker IP address to binary format the socket can work with. Then we finally connect to the attacker server. Once we have our connection set up, we need to get the contents of the text file and send it to our server. So here we use the create file win API to get a handle to the text file that the victim wants to open. The create file API returns a handle to the specified file if it exists. If it doesn't exist, it will create it and return its handle. Next, we loop through the contents of the file and read it using the refile API and store it in this variable. And then we send it to our attacker machine. And finally, we close the handle to the file and the socket and clean up the WinSock setup. And before we terminate the program, we open the text file for the victim for maximum stealth mode. The next thing we need to do after the code is compiled is to hijack the TXT extension. To do this, we need to open the Windows registry and navigate to this registry key. As you can see here, the default program that is used to open any TXT file is no path. So now let's replace this with the full path to our executable. And we have to keep the percent one here as it indicates the argument or the file that is passed to this program. Now for the server, I have Nick Cal listening on port quad seven as we specify in the code. Now, if I open this subscribe.txt file, we can see our program is executed, the notepad opens up. And if we check our Nick Cal listener, we can see the contents of the text file here. Pretty cool. But it's obvious that there's something wrong with these text files here. This console or command line window that pops up each time we open a text file is an obvious indicator that there's something suspicious happening behind the scenes. We need to take care of that too. If we open our program here in a portable executable parcel like CFF Explorer in the optional header, we can see the subsystem member is set to Windows console, which means this program depends on the command line interface to execute its code. We need to change the subsystem of this program to the Windows GUI. And to do this, we need to make some modifications. First in the code, we have to replace the main entry point or the main function with the win API win main like this. The command line arguments are now stored in this LPCMD line variable. Unlike the argvchar array, this variable stores all the provided arguments and needs further processing, like this, to extract each argument individually. Now, when we compile this, we're still going to get these two errors here. And that's because we didn't modify the subsystem for the linker. From the project tab, select the project properties, then expand the linker tab and in the system settings, double click on the subsystem and change it to Windows like this. And also to get rid of this annoying compiler warning, you have to specify the annotations for these variables like this. Now when we compile again, we should be good to go. 
You can also save yourself the trouble and create a Windows Desktop application instead of console app. Now, if we open this program in CFF Explorer again, we can see the subsystem member is set to Windows GUI. Perfect. Back in our Windows 10 VM here, replace the console version with the GUI version. And also make sure your server is running to receive the exfiltrated files. Now look at this. Notepad opens completely fine with no issues. Nothing is suspicious at all. We can see the exfiltrated contents here. And by the way, to prevent NetCap from closing after a single connection, replace the lowercase l with uppercase l like this. No matter how many files you open, it's almost impossible to tell if there's something wrong. And also Windows Defender doesn't seem to have a problem with this executable. And I promise you I didn't add any exclusions to it or anything like that. Just pure chaos. If you're wondering why it wasn't flagged, it's simply because it doesn't contain any malicious behavior. This program takes the contents of a file that is provided by the user and sends it to a hard-coded IP address and port. What we did is that we abused its behavior by replacing the default program for text files with it. So for Windows Defender, this is just another program that opens text files. That's it. Pretty cool and clever persistent mechanism I thought I could share with you. But that was for Windows 10. On Windows 11, things are completely different. Microsoft changed the registry path for text files association to this path here. Inside this path, there are these subdirectories. The one that matters to us is the user choice latest key. This key stores their prog ID or the program ID that is used to open text files. For example, if you change the default program that you use to open text files, the ID of this program is set in this prog ID key here. This prog ID corresponds to an application installed on your system, and it can be found under the H key classes root registry key. We can see here this program ID corresponds to Notepad. You might think, okay, we still can bypass this by replacing this prog ID value with another malicious program ID that we have control over. Well, people at Microsoft thought of the same thing too. So they added a hash value under the user choice latest key to validate the program ID. This hash is an 8 byte base 64 encoded value that gets set each time you change the default program for text files. So even if you change the value of the prog ID key, you still need to figure out the hashing algorithm that is used to validate this program ID. At this point I thought, okay, maybe we can modify the program ID, but perhaps we can modify the program itself. So I navigated this program ID, which corresponds to Notepad, and found a structure quite similar to the one on Windows 10. Under this directory here, one of the keys that stood out to me is this package relative executable, which contains the relative path to the Notepad executable. I tried to replace this path with the path to our program, but it didn't work, and I got this error. I thought okay maybe this path gets validated so I tried path injection or path reversal but still no luck. After that I found the absolute path to the notepad executable under the command key. I tried to modify that one too but still nothing. After that one of the things that I thought of is to find out what process modifies this hash registry key and reverse engineer its executable to figure out what hashing algorithm behind it. But I was too lazy to be honest to do this, you know, I have work and stuff and almost 90% of you guys aren't subscribed so yeah. I got frustrated. I'm pretty sure there's a way to bypass this, I just didn't dig deep enough. If you were able to find a way to bypass this somehow, please 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 let me know in the comments down below. I would really love to know how you did it. Anyways, that was a cool research that I learned a lot from. Let me know in the comments if you would like to see similar videos like this one. And don't forget to sub, I ain't telling you that again. Well, at least for this video. Anyways, outro rolls in in 3, 2, 1.